So uh, I want to open, I want to invite you rather to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 11, which is where we're going to be starting this morning. Of course, if you're joining us for the first time, particularly if you're online this morning, we want to help you kind of get up to speed with, with where we are. We want to welcome you. Um, but we want to give you some context to kind of help orient you to where we are going to be this morning. Um, so currently, we're in week 38 of a year-long series that we've been doing called Read Scripture in 2021, and hopefully we're reading a little each day with a goal of, of reading through the entirety of Scripture throughout this entire year. And each Sunday, hopefully we, we gather together and, and we hear a message based on whatever it is that we've been reading this past week. And uh, it's, it's, I hope it's been good for you. Um, it's, it's been really, really good for me just to kind of go through and teach it this way. Um, and it's a great way to, to see things in the Bible that perhaps you may have never seen or, or heard taught before just because it's kind of this 30,000 foot approach to, to teaching scripture. But admittedly, it also means that sometimes we're skipping over or flying over some things that really deserve a lot more of our attention. And so case in point, um, after several weeks that we spent in Matthew's gospel, we, we spent all of one week in Mark's gospel. And then we spent all of one week again in John's gospel. And today happens to be the first of two weeks that we get to spend in Luke's gospel. And that means that we're just going to be jumping into this text kind of head first this morning. Uh, we're going to skip the first 10 chapters and we're going to find ourselves right here in the midst of, of kind of one day in time in, in Luke's gospel. So with that said, I'm going to invite you to join me for a word of prayer. And as I, as I often do, and I invite you to maybe consider standing or, or kneeling before the Father as we talk to him this morning. Let's, let's talk to God. Uh, most righteous and heavenly Father, King of kings, Lord of lords, uh, we praise you and we glorify you today. It's a blessing to be in this place. It's a blessing to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and even as, as some gather here, there are others we know who, who couldn't be here today for one reason or another, and we pray your blessing on them as well. Uh, Father, as, as we stop and, and, and still ourselves and go into your word, Father, I pray that your word would come alive for us. I pray that, that you would help us to see things that we wouldn't ordinarily see. I pray that you would stir us in ways you've never stirred us. And today I pray that, that, that something within us would, would grow, would change, would become just slightly more Christ-like than the person we walked in this morning. I pray, Father, that, that we, we never just show up and come and sit in these chairs and, and, and do the, the church thing without, without truly letting this penetrate our hearts and change us in some way. And so I pray that we have the courage to kind of set aside some of ourselves and become more like you every day, every, every hour, every minute, every moment, more like you, deeply, deeply in prayer with you, in conversation with you, in community with you, and with one another. And so, Father, today, may these words spoken not be mine, but yours. May our ears hear, may our eyes see, and may we be like you today. That's my prayer. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Uh, so earlier this week, I, I was on social media just kind of doing what I think a lot of us do in this day and age, just scrolling through, wasting time, watching a few videos. And I saw a guy, uh, I think originally he, he was on TikTok. Maybe you guys have seen this, maybe not. But it's a man who, who would sit down in his living room floor and he would take his hand and he would put on his pretend seatbelt and he would turn his pretend keys in his ignition and he would grab his pretend steering wheel. And while he's seated on the floor of his living room, he would without moving his feet or anything, he would drive away in his pretend car. And if, if you saw it, you could probably envision a little bit better than you can right now as I'm, as I'm explaining it. But the nature of, of this video was a series of people who were trying to, in some way, debunk what he was doing and thought they'd figured out how to, how, to, how, to, how to break him in this moment. And so someone might say, okay, but do it again, but you know, this time make something in the background move, or, or do it again and this time put a mirror behind you, or do it again and make sure that the TV is on behind you as you do it, or, or go somewhere else, not in your living room and do it, or take your socks off and do it. And it's just one after another after another. And so for two minutes, he's doing clip after clip after clip, kind of honoring all these requests that, that people thought would, would kind of disprove his ability to actually do what he's doing. Everyone's trying to stump him. Rest assured, he's not actually doing what he's insinuating he's doing, but, but all his viewers are kind of eager to test him and stump him, if you will, until this little illusion of his kind of falls apart and fails. And this is kind of the, the nature of what makes 
magic or, or illusion or sleight of hand so fascinating to us, right? We, we love to watch people do unbelievable things and then try to figure out how they did it because, well, we don't actually believe that they did it, right? That's kind of the nature of things. And so the funny thing is that the illusionist knows they're fooling us and we know we're being fooled. We know it's not possible. And so the only real question at the end of the day is, is not did they do it, but how? How do they do that? And it kind of reminds me of one of my, my favorite illusionists. I'm sure it's a guy that, that many of you are, are familiar with. You guys ever heard of or watched David Blaine? A lot of us are probably familiar with David Blaine. Um, I was in high school the first time I watched a, a David Blaine special, and I'm, I'm watching this guy. He's in the, the Dallas Cowboys locker room in the 90s with all their Super Bowl teams. And so I'm watching Emmett Smith and Deion Sanders and a whole bunch of legends who are watching this guy right up close do things with cards and other things. And, and the only reaction they can have as he does trick after trick after trick is just to run out of the room yelling because they're, they're so overcome with amazement. Like, ah, how did he do that? They're clearly amazed by what they're seeing. But again... They know, we know, he knows that this is all just an illusion. This is not real. And this is why I kind of came to love David Blaine because he could have just left it there. He could have just let that be kind of who he was. He'd be one of an, a number of people, the, the Houdinis, the Copperfields, and so on, that we've, we've come to know. And, and he would have been great. He would have had a great career. But as his career advances, he kind of starts thinking to himself, like, what if I'm not actually tricking people? What if I just start doing some truly unbelievable things and, and I'm actually just doing them? And so he starts researching and, and researching and researching and he discovers that with a lot of practice, he can start doing things that nobody has ever done before, things that, that truly seem completely unbelievable. So in 2008, he goes on Oprah Winfrey and he jumps inside of a, a giant glass globe, if you will, and he proceeds to hold his breath breaking the Guinness Book of World Records as he held his breath underwater for 17 minutes and four seconds. And of course, the guy whose record he broke said, that can't happen. So he went and broke David Blaine's record immediately after, which caused David Blaine to have to go on the Regis and Kelly show and break it again at 17 minutes and 19 seconds. And of course, also around this time, he starts studying other things. He, he learns how to swallow fish and frogs whole and kind of keep them alive in his stomach until he decides he wants them back again, in which case he can do that. And I'll save you the gory details, but... Um, <laughs> and so at this point, Blaine's career is at a point where when he does something truly unbelievable, he's at least made you wonder, wait, is this an illusion? Or is he actually doing this stuff? And, and that kind of sets him apart from everybody else in the game that he's competing with, whether it's Copperfield or Chris Angel or whoever. So, why do I bring this up and, and what does this have to do with the Gospel of Luke? And that's a good point or a good question. And the answer to that question has a lot to do with where we left off last week in the Gospel of John. Because if you'll remember, one of the things that we talked about last week was in John, the, the uniqueness of, of acknowledging the signs that Jesus was performing. You remember that? We talked a little bit about signs last week. John's gospel is unique in that it acknowledges all these signs that Jesus is performing in his ministry. And it culminated with this amazing event where two dear friends of Jesus, uh, Mary and Martha, send word that their brother Lazarus is sick. And not just a little bit sick, but, but deathly ill. He, he's on the verge of death. But instead of Jesus rushing to the scene like you, you might expect and, and healing Lazarus, he instead does nothing. He does nothing for, for two entire days. And Lazarus dies, and everyone grieves, and hope for Lazarus seems lost. And then Jesus steps forward, and he does the unthinkable. He does the unbelievable, and he has the people roll away the stone in front of Lazarus' tomb, and he calls to Lazarus to come out, and he does. He does. And so what was once thought to be impossible what was once thought to be permanent, death, had now just been defeated by this Jesus, which left everybody around him amazed, and it left the Pharisees awfully, awfully angry. And so it was a reminder to us last week that the glory of God begins where the greatness of man ends. In other words, as great as some people are, and, and there are lots of great people, there's a limit to our greatness, and, and death comes for us all, but the glory of God 
and Jesus, his son, supersedes all of that, and unbelievable things can actually start to happen. And so all of this makes you wonder, can you believe this? Do you believe this? And last week when I asked that question, you all said yes, so I, I assume that you do. And so as we ended last week, that, that's the tension that we're left with. Now, if you're familiar with the Gospels, there's a point in all four Gospels where, where Jesus kind of stops roaming from place to place and doing miracles and doing various signs, and instead he focuses attention in each Gospel on, on eventually moving physically toward the city of Jerusalem. He's moving there for Passover and, and what is ultimately going to be his, his demise. But what's interesting is how different Luke's account of this moment is from all the others. For instance, in Matthew's gospel, from the time he starts heading to Jerusalem until the time he gets there is all of about one chapter. In Mark's gospel, did I say Mark before? Matthew's one chapter, Mark is one chapter, uh, John is even less than that, about half a chapter. And yet in Luke, Jesus begins that journey in chapter 9, and he doesn't get to Jerusalem until chapter 19. So it takes 10 or, or more than 10 chapters, which is a huge difference. And so when we look at Luke 11, this, this series of, of stories that we're going to be talking about today falls smack dab in the middle of that journey. Jesus is headed toward Jerusalem. And it also means that, that Luke 11 probably takes place slightly before the raising of Lazarus that we talked about last week. So if you're trying to picture a timeline, think slightly before where we were last week. So let's begin. We're going to be in Luke 11, beginning in verse 14. I'm going to kind of summarize the beginning here that, that one day, as, as part of this journey to Jerusalem, Jesus encounters a man who we're told is mute. In other words, he's unable to speak. And the reason for that, we're told, is that he has a demon. And so Jesus does what, what Jesus often does. He comes in and he deals with the problem. He fixes the situation. He casts out the demon. And as he does that, there are three reactions from the people who are watching. Number one, uh, a group of people there are said to have been amazed. So some of the crowd are watching. They're, they're kind of reacting like a David Blaine special. They're amazed at what they see. And, and who could blame them? This guy wasn't talking, and now he's able to talk. I'm amazed by that. The second are what I'm calling the accusatory. Uh, these are the people who are basically saying that the only reason that Jesus could drive out demons is by the power of the prince of demons. That this is, this is evil. This is Satan at work. That's the only way Jesus could do what he's doing. And third are, are what I'm calling the authenticating. Of course, it's a, it's a preacher thing, right? You have three A's. You've got you to get that alliteration in there. But in, in reality, this is the skeptics. They're basically the ones who are saying that they haven't seen enough yet. They haven't seen enough. They need Jesus to prove that what he just did was genuine, which is not altogether unlike what we do with illusionists and sleight of hand people and all that stuff today. Now, at first glance, what develops over the rest of this chapter might look like several very unrelated uh, stories and, and random pieces of Jesus' teaching. It's not. That's what I want you to understand today. Everything that Jesus is getting ready to say and do throughout the entire rest of Luke chapter 11 ties back to uh, these three reactions, amazed, accusatory, or authenticating. So to those who are amazed, uh, obviously nothing new really needs to be said. They're, they're amazed uh, because they believe and they trust the work that Jesus is doing. They're saying, this is real. I'm amazed by that. So instead, Jesus turns his attention first to the accusatory. Uh, this is verse 17. It says, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. So if Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? He says, I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebul, which is kind of another word for like Lord of the Flies, sort of. Uh, it's another word for Satan, another nickname for, for that, that figure. He says, now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, he says, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, Jesus says it wouldn't make any sense for him to be driving out demons with, with evil motive or with evil power because that would be a divided house. And a divided house will destroy itself from the inside out, which I think makes some sense to us, right? I think we understand that to some degree. And if you, if you don't, look no further than the American Civil War. 
which is the, the deadliest war in American history. In fact, there are more casualties from the American Civil War than for the U.S. in World War II and World War I combined. But even more recently than that, just these last several years, I think we've seen the disastrous effects of a nation divided. Just this year, we watched as American citizens invaded the, the U.S. Capitol building, right? We, we've seen some of this stuff at work in our midst uh, just in recent days. And then downstream from that, I've, I have friends who are leading churches all over the country who are reeling from the last several years of internal strife and conflict among members in their churches who are dealing with competing views on, on LGBTQ issues and racism and abortion and masking and vaccination and all other forms of, of information and misinformation. This, this should be probably no surprise to any of us. So I think Jesus' point is well taken. It would be insanely stupid for Satan to drive out his own demons. Would we agree? That's what Jesus is saying. That, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And while there's a little bit more that we could unpack, I, I want to jump ahead slightly to verse 29. Because in verse 29, Jesus turns his attention now from the accusatory, and he speaks to what I'm calling the authenticators, the skeptics among the crowd, those who demand to see more before they believe, before they agree that Jesus is really who he says he is, before Jesus is, is authentic, before they, they believe that he really is doing what he claims to be doing. So verse 29 says, as the crowds increased, Jesus said, you know, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. Now, this passage is one of the reasons why I chose to preach this text this week, uh, among all of the things I could have talked about from the first 11 chapters of, of Luke. And the reasons are kind of simple. One, we just read the story of Jonah not that long ago uh, as part of this series, right? And, and the reason for doing that was because Jonah's story is not done. He, J Jesus is going to reference Jonah. We, we're going to see references to him throughout the rest of the Bible. So it's useful to know what Jesus is talking about when he's making references like this. And also, if you have a keen eye and kind of a good memory from where we were last week, there's a good chance you're asking yourself now why Luke's words here, or Jesus' words in Luke, are, are like 180 degrees different from what we talked about last week in John. Because after all, uh, John makes a deliberate point of showing us all of these signs that point to the authenticity of Jesus. And then Luke comes along with these words from Jesus who say it's a wicked generation that asks for a sign. So what's the deal there? Why, why the, the seeming conflict? What's that all about? And I want you to think of it this way. Suppose for a moment that you're a really, really good cook. And you invite me over to, to come to your house and you make me a meal and I sit down and I eat it, and it's amazing. Just one of the best meals I've ever had in my life. And then you invite me over a second time, and it's even better than the first. Probably Janet's cooking is, is that good, if I had to guess. She told me this morning she burns her own eggs. Um, but you invite me over a third time, and it, it's equally amazing, just delicious food. If after all of that, I'm still kind of over here in the corner thinking to myself, you know, I'm not sure if she's a really good cook or if he's a really good cook. Maybe he just got lucky for, for three straight weeks. Like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not quite convinced yet. Like, you've demonstrated it time after time after time. You're a really great cook. And so the fact is, if I don't believe it by now, am I ever going to believe it? It doesn't matter if I have four meals or five meals or six meals. I'm always going to wonder. Maybe they're just getting lucky. And that's really Jesus' point. It's not that signs are bad or that signs don't have their place, because after all, that is how John's gospel begins. It's that there's a point when the resistance isn't about a lack of evidence. It's about a hard and a blind heart. Do you follow what I'm saying? One commentator puts it this way. He says, the gospel of John builds on the premise that Jesus performed miracles as signs. But the present passage does not stand in opposition to the meaningful use of signs, but rather to the unbelief that resists the testimony already obvious in the messianic works. There's a resistant heart. Another commentator says this. He says, one can hardly be critical of the request for a sign. The difficulty must be the request in the context of Jesus' ministry before them. Such a ministry has its own inner self-authentication. A request for a sign is already a refusal to see what is going on before one's very eyes. So, 
it's one thing to give signs, and it's quite another to continue to demand more of them and more of them and more of them, just disregarding all that Jesus has already done to this point. And that really is the problem that Jesus is addressing here in Luke. But he does say something interesting. He says there is one more sign that's coming, and it's a future sign. It's the sign of Jonah. So what does he mean? Well, if you've read the other Gospels, the the most obvious nod that we get is kind of reinforced in Matthew's Gospel for us. Because in, in Matthew chapter 12, it says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, some people read Luke 11, and their, their mind naturally gravitates to Matthew 12, and they go, oh, okay, that's what he was talking about. And I want to be clear, it, it absolutely is that too. But in Luke, the sign of Jonah that, that Jesus is talking about, I think, is, is more broadly applicable than that. So I want to ask you this. Go back a few months and, and try to jog your memory for what we talked about when we read Jonah. What was Jonah being sent to Nineveh to do? What was he being sent to do? Do you remember? If you you remember, God was sending Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh or in Nineveh because the people there were being wicked. And so despite Jonah's attempts to kind of run the other direction and get as far away from that request as he possibly could, what happened when Jonah walked into Nineveh and finally did what God asked him to do? Well, it says that the, the people believed God, they repented, and they were spared from destruction. And so when Jesus is telling them that what Jonah was to the Ninevites, he is going to be to this generation, that's the comparison that he's making, that the Jesus has come to preach repentance to a, a wicked generation. So he continues. This is verse 31. He says, The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. And so again, this, this is why this series has been useful. Because if you remember, back in 1 Kings chapter 10, which we covered some months back, there's this moment where King Solomon, the, the son of David, receives this visit from the queen of Sheba. And it says that the queen of Sheba had heard a, a great deal about Solomon. She'd heard about the, his incredible relationship with God. She'd heard about his incredible wisdom and all this stuff. But she didn't believe until she kind of visited and saw with her own two eyes and heard with her own two ears. And yet by the end of her visit, we're told that she was so amazed, so impressed by what she she saw and what she heard from Solomon that she realized she hadn't even heard the half of it. He was far more wise, far more impressive than, than she could have ever dreamed or imagined. And so here in Luke, Jesus references her visit. This is hundreds of years later. And he tells the crowds that when the end comes, when the judgment comes, It is her and not them who will rise to eternal life while this generation, the the people he's talking to in the crowd, he says, will stand condemned. So you keep reading. Verse 32, uh, Jesus is going to go back to his Jonah reference. He's going to draw a similar conclusion about the people of Nineveh that they also will rise to eternal life while these skeptics, these authenticators, will stand condemned. And so the question is why? Why is Jesus saying this? Why is Jesus trying to make this point? It's because the queen of Sheba and the Ninevites had one key thing in common, that when they heard the teaching of Solomon and when they heard the teaching of Jonah, they listened and they believed. And now Jesus says something greater than Solomon, something greater than Jonah is here. And it's him. It's him. And I want you to stop for just a moment. That's, that's impressive enough as it is. But I want you to really stop and consider exactly the depth or, or the significance of what Jesus is really saying. Because I want you to ask yourself, take everything you know or think you know about Jesus and, 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 and just the kind of the biblical worldview at this point in time and ask yourself, who is the Queen of Sheba? Who are the Ninevites? Are they God's chosen people? Are they the Israelites? Are they the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah and so on? Is that who they are? Go like this. That's, that's not who they are. In fact, they're Gentiles. 
which means they're, they're non-Israelites. They're not part of God's chosen people. And here Jesus is telling a crowd of people who think that they're something because they have the right ancestry and they follow all the right rules, that because these Gentile people listened and believed what they were given, instead of demanding more, that they will rise to eternal life while all these crowds of people who, who seemingly have all the right boxes checked will stand condemned. And so Jesus explains a little bit more in verse 33. And it's tempting as you read this to, to immediately think of Matthew's gospel, because in, in Matthew's gospel, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is saying some very, very similar words. But as I said a week or two ago, we always have to ask, why this, why here, why now? In other words, when Jesus starts talking about lamps, we, we have to ask why it's happening in Luke 11 in a very different part of the story than when Jesus said something very similar in Matthew chapter 6. It's not random. It's very, very intentional. And here's what Jesus is saying. Verse 33, he says, you guys, he says, no one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. He says, instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in may see the light. He says, your eye is the lamp of your body. And when your eyes are healthy, your whole body also is full of light. But when they're unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. And so see to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full as the light as when a lamp shines its light on you. So here's what Jesus means. I want you to think about your home. You all go home sometimes, it's dark out, and you go over and you flip a light switch to turn on the light. Where is it? Is it, is it hidden in the closet somewhere? Is it behind a cabinet door somewhere? No, it's, it's out in the open, kind of not necessarily right in the middle of the room, although it could be overhead or whatever. But it's, it's there in the, in the room, obviously placed so that you can help see other things by it. Why? Because if you put it behind a door or under a bowl, it, it can't do its job there. Its job is to make you see and to see everything else by it. And so Jesus is talking to the crowds, and he's referring to himself here as that kind of light. In other words, just like a lamp in a room, he's not out hiding what he's doing. It's not under a bowl. It's not behind closed doors. He's doing it out in the open. It's on full display for everyone to see. He's healing the sick. He's restoring the sight to the blind. He's helping lame people walk. He's driving out demons and so much more. It's all very evident and obvious, just like a lamp is in a dark room. And so because of that, the point Jesus is making here is that if you're having trouble seeing the light, it's not because something is wrong with the light. It's because something is wrong with your eyes. Something's wrong with your eyes. Healthy eyes see light. But unhealthy eyes can't see even what's, what's obviously right there in front of them. They're blind to it. That's a, a key characteristic of unhealthy eyes. And so Jesus looks at a crowd of people who are trying to test him, who are skeptical, who are trying to authenticate him and prove that he is or he isn't a fraud. And he's basically saying, guys, if you can't see what's going on by now, more signs aren't, aren't the answer. Those are not going to help you see anything. Healthy eyes are. So you've got to do something about your eyes. And so as Luke 11 draws to a close, we get one more story that's going to kind of drive home exactly what this kind of blindness looks like. And so we're told that when Jesus finished speaking, a Pharisee uh, invited Jesus to share a meal with him. And I get the feeling kind of as I read this, that this, this Pharisee is very much trying to prove or to demonstrate to Jesus that, that he's wrong, that these are just normal, skeptical people who... who yeah, they're not fully bought in, but, but they're not trying to be unreasonable. And, and, and it doesn't mean just because they're not fully bought in now that more signs wouldn't, wouldn't help that process or more evidence wouldn't help that process. And I resonate with this guy because in a lot of ways, I'm him. I totally understand where he's coming from because I'm the guy who wants to sit down. I'll have the reasonable conversation. I'm the, I'm the guy who can posture in front like I'm, I'm really open-minded and I'm really paying attention to what you have to say and I'm really eager to learn something from you. But deep down, sometimes my mind is made up. Please don't tell my wife that. 
And so as we keep reading, he's not able to hide his struggle for even a moment. It says Jesus goes in with him, he reclines at the table, and immediately it says this. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Because you see, the Pharisees have a code of conduct. They have a way of doing things, and it's more than just etiquette. It's, it's fundamentalism. What is fundamentalism? Well, Merriam-Webster says it's a movement or attitude stressing strict and literal adherence to a set of basic principles. And so to the Pharisee, washing is not etiquette. It's not optional. It's mandatory. And Jesus didn't do the thing that you're all supposed to know to do. But what he doesn't realize in the midst of, of his shock and his amazement is he just proved Jesus' point about everything else that, had been, that Jesus had been saying. Because here's a man who's a supposedly faithful man of God, and he's fortunate enough to sit across the table and share a meal, not just with a rabbi, not just with a great teacher, not even with just a prophet, but with the Messiah with the Son of God, with God incarnate, with the King of kings, the Lord of lords. This is the anointed one that they've all been waiting for. And in this moment, he can't see past his own fundamentalism to realize it. He's blind to the light that is sharing a table with him right now. Church, how many times have you heard someone say, man, I, I just wish I could have a conversation with Jesus. I just wish I could see him and hug him and talk to him. There's so much I want to say. You ever heard someone talk like that? You ever said something like that yourself? Because it sounds nice. Man, it sounds like a great Hallmark card, doesn't it? Like, I want to just really embrace Jesus. But it, but it really makes you wonder. If Jesus sat at my table, or if he knocked on, on my door, or even if you walked into the, the doors of some of our churches, would we recognize him? Would we recognize him or... Would we see the light that just entered the room? Or do we have our own traditions and our own customs and our own fundamentals that would blind us to him too? That's the question that we should be thinking right now. And so Jesus kind of lets him and whoever may be standing around just, just have it. He lays into them. He says, now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish. But inside... You're full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. He says, woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint and your rue and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice. You neglect the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. What did Jesus just say? Well, funny enough, one of the guaranteed ways to make yourself unclean in the law that they're trying to follow is to touch or to be close to a dead body. And what Jesus just said in verse 44 is that the Pharisees are like unmarked graves. In other words, he says people are making themselves unclean just by being in your presence. And they don't even know it. You guys are like corpses. And so verse 45 says, one of the experts in law answered him, teacher, when you say these things, you're insulting us also. And Jesus replied, and you, experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. He says, woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. In other words, you kind of celebrate what happened. 
And so because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you, experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were, hind- who were entering. Wow. Anybody want to sit across from Jesus at a table and hear those words directed at you? There's a lot here. And I wish we had, we had time to really, really dig into every little bit and piece and nuance. But just look at the nature of Jesus' rebuke. You're not generous to the poor. You're neglecting justice. You're neglecting the love of God. I mean, all of these things preach extremely well in 2021. Amen? These are all highly relevant topics. We could spend weeks talking about generosity. We could spend weeks talking about justice. We could spend weeks talking about loving God more. But there's a central idea that pervades this entire chapter of Luke that I want us to focus on and see this morning. I'm trying to stay focused on it. When I am most amazed by being praised, I will remain unfazed when Jesus is raised. It's very rhymy and very corny, I fully admit. But here's what I mean. In the midst of Jesus doing some incredible things, amazing things, unbelievable things, there were three core reactions. There were those who were amazed at him. There were those who accused him. And there were those who were really, really amazed and impressed with themselves. And for the latter group, No amount of of signs or wonders was going to turn their hearts. Nothing was going to help them see, to help them see somebody or something that they'd hardened their hearts or blinded their eyes to see. And so, like like narcissists from Greek mythology, if you've ever read this story, it's where we get the word narcissistic. They'd grown overwhelmingly in love with their own reflection to the point where they could they could only see their own brilliance. They could only see their own beauty, and they were blind to the one true God who walked among them, the one true God sitting across the table from them. And so as we saw last week, it wasn't going to matter what Jesus did. He could, he could heal all infirmities. He could feed the masses. He could raise the dead like he did Lazarus last week. And all they were going to do was react with self-righteousness and plot to kill him because to them, he was a threat. He was a threat to their own beauty He was a threat to their own power because they were people who were amazed with themselves, amazed with their rules, amazed with their fundamentals. They were people who were addicted to to the respect and praise of all the people around them who thought so highly of them. They were people who were unfazed by anything Jesus could possibly say or do. When I'm most amazed by being praised, I'll, I'll remain unfazed when Jesus is raised. Nothing, nothing will faze me. And so church, whether those words or that phrase is memorable or connects with you is, is kind of beside the point. The point and the reality is that even today, we are not immune from relating to God or to Jesus in much the same way. Because for some of us, that means that no matter how many times Jesus shows up, no matter how many times he blesses our socks off, no matter how many times he answers that prayer in a moment of crisis, no matter how many times he's given us our daily bread and met our most basic needs, We'll continue to question him. We'll continue to doubt him. We'll continue to deny him. We'll continue to ignore him. For others of us, it might mean that when God's way of doing things in this life comes into conflict or opposition with the ways that I want to live my life or the things that I want to believe, I will always assume that my way is the best way, that my way is the right way, that my way is actually God's way because my way could never be wrong. And still for others... We might be so used to, to being the most important person in our own lives that we're blind and we're obstinate to anything Jesus might be doing to call us out, 
to call us into something deeper, into something greater, into something beyond what we could ever fathom or imagine for ourselves. And so if we believe what we say we believe, if we truly believe what we say we believe, that Jesus literally lived and literally died and literally rose again and defeated death, we have to ask, how can so many of us be so unfazed, so unemotional, so unmoved, so unmovable when it comes to following Jesus with these lives that we've been given. And so I want to ask you this. It's not a question I need a response for, but something for you to meditate on. When was the last time you really stood in awe of Jesus? When was the last time that you believed anything was possible? When was the last time the good news of the gospel of Christ was really good news to you? The kind of news that you, you, couldn't, you couldn't silence yourself. You had to go and tell somebody. When was the last time it was good news to you in that kind of way? Because for some of us, Jesus is unbelievable in the best possible way. We love everything about him, every moment with him. We offer everything in ourselves to him. But there are others of us, perhaps, this morning who kind of look at Jesus in similar ways to the way we look at David Blaine, with constant skepticism. And so maybe we enjoy the idea of him, or we think following him uh, or following the Bible seems like a, a nice, you know, moral way to live, but we're, we're always assuming that he's, he falls short. He's some sort of farce, some sort of phony, some religious guy who managed to pull the wool over our eyes 2,000 years ago, and, and that's all he'll ever be, and we haven't figured it out yet. If that latter description is in any way descriptive or reflective of who you are this morning or where you are, then let me suggest that Jesus' words to the Pharisees and, and the crowd might deserve some consideration, that maybe the issue isn't the genuineness of the light, but it's the eyes with which we are trying to see. Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. So have you sought him? Have you asked? Have you knocked? And are you willing to look past your own reflection to see the beauty of Christ all around you? It is to that Christ that I invite each of you today. Uh, in just a moment, John's going to lead us in a closing song. And I'm going to be sitting up here in the front row. And if in any way the Holy Spirit's been doing anything in your heart and in your life this week or this morning, and you're thinking to yourself, you know what? I've, I've been far too nonchalant, far too lackadaisical with all this stuff. It, it's time that I'm, I'm really serious about the fact that Jesus is who he says he is, and that means something in my life. It means that I'm, I'm ready to give myself away. I'm ready to dedicate myself to him. Then I want to invite you to do that. You can be baptized into Christ this very morning, and you can receive the gift of his Holy Spirit and eternal life. And if you'd rather talk to me afterward in the courtyard today, you're welcome to do that as well. If you're watching online today, you can email us at questions at lakemercedchurch.com. I would love to talk with you more about whatever God is doing on your heart. But that's the invitation. And uh, the rest of it is, is yours. I, I pray that the Holy Spirit is doing something in you, something beyond what I could fathom or imagine, that these words are his words and not mine. But with that said, I invite you to stand and let's sing, church.